we have a new building, but we're still in the same series of Job. <laughs> but it's good. We're excited by it. I'm still going through it. I've got a few things left in it yet. I think it might take us up to Christmas with all the different guests we've got coming in the next few weeks and months. Uh, and so I just want to share a little bit uh, on week number seven we are. I don't think I've ever done a seven-week series before. I've almost caught up with Alpha, which is 13 weeks. If I beat that, that'll be great. Um, and so we're doing a seven. This is number seven. Uh, and I just want to share something again. And, and this probably is the thing that a lot of people will certainly know Job for. Uh, we're going to talk today about endurance. Endurance. Any good endurance runners in the building? And know a lot about endurance. No one that's admitting to it anyway. Oh, Paul, yeah, with a wheelbarrow in his hand is a great, yeah. But uh, yeah, so we're going to talk and share about endurance today. Uh, and why, why is that such an important thing? Why is, it, why is it something that Job's associated with? Well, actually, James in the New Testament, all that way further on, thousands of years after Job, this is something that he remembers Job and his story all about. And this is what it says in Job 5. Verse 11, it says this, we give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. Wow. James, thousands of years after Job, remembers Job for his endurance. So endurance is massively, massively important. And in that bit that we just read about James there, we, we see that actually J Job got to the point of incredible blessing. And just maybe, maybe sometimes we don't quite get to that point of great blessing God has for us because we just haven't quite got the endurance. Maybe there's this thing somewhere that God wants us to get to, but maybe we just give up a little bit too easy. And I know that's easy to say, very much more difficult to do when you're in the middle of a trial or a difficulty. But maybe God's incredible blessing is there. But the point is, we've got to get there. We've got to get through to the end to get to that point. And right now, maybe you're going through a tough time. Maybe you're trial. Maybe you're in a trial or you're suffering or there's some part of your life that you've just, in fact, it seems to have been going on forever. But whatever you call it, whether it's a trial, whether it's suffering, whether it's troubles, whatever it may be, it's absolutely key that you get to the end of it. And if you get to the end of it, you will need endurance. So we're just going to look at that this morning for a short while. Uh, and in fact, it's a thing that actually runs right through Scripture, right from Genesis to Revelation, is this theme of, of suffering and endurance going together. Suffering and endurance. And we're going to look at three different sort of areas of that this morning uh, that will just, I hope, encourage you. Uh, some, some, of them, some of the bits that you think, oh man, that's not really what I want to hear. I just want to be taken out of it. I don't want to endure it. I want to just be out of it. But endurance is absolutely key. And there's three things we're going to look at today. From the New Testament, first of all, we're going to look at that link between endurance and suffering. We're going to look at what Jesus said about it and what Paul said about it. Then we're going to just bring back to Job, and we're going to just look at his journey through endurance. This guy who was known for his endurance, yet when you look at his middle part of his life, he didn't feel as though he was enduring that much. So that's an encouragement to us too. And finally, we're going to look at some just encourage, uh, real keys to endurance from the book of Hebrews. You're all worried that that sounds like an awful lot to fit in to a 30-minute message. Don't panic. Although, you should panic. There's no clock on the back wall in this building. <laughs> panic greatly. So I will keep looking at my watch and then I know what happens. You will instantly look at your watch when I look at mine. So let's start off. Endurance and suffering. That link between that, we're going to look at it right now. So the first thing in the New Testament, what we need to understand is that Jesus taught suffering and endurance go together. And if Jesus taught it, that if you're a Christian, also you can expect it. Let's look at what he says. In Matthew 10, verse 22, he says these words. So this is Jesus talking. And all nations will hate you because you are my followers. Now, that's not a tagline that we put on the fence outside to try and entice people into the building. All people will hate you because you are my followers. That's not the thing we all think we signed up for, is it, when we said yes to Jesus. And this is what he carries on. But everyone who endures to the end will be saved. 
We have to endure to the end. When we listened last week to Andy talking about some of the different things in Open Doors, I don't know if you've sort of, it's some of the stuff has just been stuck in my head still from last week as I listened to him and he shared some of the stories of what different people go through. And then we, we ate with him and he told us some more stories while we were eating with him of people literally swimming from North Korea to get to Korea or wherever it might be that they went in different places for days and days on end to escape the persecution. Just incredible, incredible stories of, of, of people that understand what suffering for the sake of Jesus really, really is. And Jesus taught it, and yet we, it seems so far really to our lives in many, many ways. But it's not just that. Even this week, I was watching something of someone that's actually related to someone in church that was on TV. And they were talking about their case of, of, of real religious discrimination as a Christian. And how they'd got done and they were in trouble. Uh, and actually they'd come through it and, and they were saying, actually, it was only because of a, I'm a Christian that I had trouble in this area. So we can expect it here. It will come here and we need to be ready. But the truth is we need to be able to make it to the end. We need to get through that. You see, starting is easy. If you're in a race, everyone starts in exactly the same position. doesn't matter how fit you are or how well you are in jaw. I could stand next to Usain Bolt and I'm in exactly the same spot when we do, before we do the 100 meters or Mo Farah if we're running a marathon. But the chances are he might finish before me. You never know. But um, Starting is easy, but what we need to do is we need to decide that we're going to go the distance. Right now, you need to decide in your heart that whatever comes, whatever happens, I'm going to make it to the end. And I believe, actually, that's what a Christian is. A Christian isn't someone that starts. It's someone that gets to the start. They understand Jesus. They accept him into his life. And they say at that moment, I'm going to make it to the end. And you think, well, you can't do that. Yeah, you can. Because that's what faith is all about. So that's what Jesus says. Jesus taught endurance and suffering go together. But Paul said something deeper even, I believe. Because not only does Jesus say we can expect it, but Paul tells us there's purpose in it. There's reason in it. And that's incredible for you to help, to know that this isn't just going on mindlessly with nothing. Romans chapter 5 and the, the three, verses 3 to 5. This is what Paul says as he's writing to the church in Rome. He says this. He says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Wow, we can rejoice when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. I'm going to help you all by taking my watch off so I can see the time on here. I can always remember other ministers doing that when I was a young boy. And it means that I can look at that and I can look at that. And you don't know I'm looking at the clock. And so you don't think, oh, he's been going for a while now. So what's Paul saying here? Paul's saying that our problems, our trials, our difficulties have a purpose. There's a reason in it because they develop endurance. And if you want to develop endurance, actually the only way you can develop endurance is to have some troubles or some trials or some suffering. And if we want to endure, we've got to understand that. Because what happens is as you have a suffering and you endure that, Paul tells us that develops character in you. And boy, do we need a people that are Christians now that have some character. We're fed up of having a church full of people that might have charisma, but unfortunately have no character. The stories we read about, the different things that are around the world, full of great charismatic people, incredibly gifted, but unfortunately their character isn't there. Why? Because they've not endured some suffering probably. And so they haven't got to this point. So if you want to be someone that is representing God well, you have to have some suffering to be able to endure it, to bring you to a point of character. We need it. And it's not something that comes overnight. It doesn't just happen overnight. It's through a series of trials and difficulties that God develops character in us. And he's more interested in your character than he is in your gift. He's more interested in your character than he is in the gift that he wants to give you. Not that that's not important, but he's more interested in that. And then our character, it says, produces hope. And we're going to look a little bit at hope later on. And particularly in a few weeks' time, we're going to look at hope in review of Job and in general. 
So that's the first thing he says. And the second thing that Paul tells us about sort of suffering and endurance and how it goes together is in Corinthians. And actually, this is what Paul sort of set his weekly prayer thing on last week, which was great. It was amazing that we didn't know we were going to do this same thing together. But Paul just read these verses, and it was great as I prayed through that this week to sort of look at the things that we're talking about today. So this is what Paul writes to the church in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, all praise to God. Isn't it great? He talks about suffering. In Romans, he says, we can rejoice. In Corinthians, he says, all praise to God. He doesn't start, oh my word, it's a disaster. (laughs) He starts, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we're weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things that we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort that God gives us. Wow, what an incredibly encouragement thing that is. We've just seen that sort of endurance, Paul's told us, produces character. And here he gives us yet another purpose for why you might be suffering at the moment, why you might be going through that there's purpose in it, and actually another key to endurance. You see, part of your purpose of of suffering and trouble and trials uh, and uh, and actually being able to endure to the end of it is so that you can help someone else. So that you actually, God's preparing you for something that is ahead that you can't do if you don't go through the trial. You see, if you've come through, if, if you've come through a trial, and sometimes we're like this, we're all different in how we treat things. Maybe you're in the middle of it right now, and your focus is entirely on, oh, woe is, oh, I'm all dead. This is terrible. I'm, why is this all happening? And if you're, you, we've all seen people that have, have had that approach when they're in the middle of a suffering or a trial, compared to someone who suddenly is in the middle of this awful situation, but their heart is, what can I do to help someone else? What can I do? that? What what would this do that would mean that I could bring some hope to somebody else? And their outlook is completely different in exactly the same circumstance. Why? Because they're not just looking in at the things that are going wrong. And I, I know some people go through terrible times and it's very difficult to look outwards. But Paul's saying it's so important right now that we do. Because otherwise you won't see a purpose in it. You'll see this is just pointless and useless and wasted. But actually, Paul is saying here that there is a purpose in it. There's a purpose in it for the bigger body, for the whole of the world. I'm so encouraged uh, over the last few sort of probably year, 18 months. We've had quite a lot of people that have suffered with cancer in different ways and going through the treatment. And to me, it's just a person in this church. It's been so encouraging as as each one has got alongside another one and said, oh, come on, yeah, this is a tough part, but you can do this. You can get through this. Now, that person will accept that person's encouragement far more than me just saying, oh, yeah, I think you'll be all right. But when they've been there, when they've done it. I'm sure you all know, anyone else understand? When someone that's gone through a trial shares with you, you understand this person knows what they're talking about. And I'll take that so much and it's such an encouragement to you. And so there's something that you've gone through for a purpose to help somebody else through their trial. So there's purpose in it, Paul teaches us, uh, in two different ways. So let's look quickly now at Job's journey of endurance. And I'm encouraged by this because, look, trust me, he wasn't perfect in it. He struggled through it all, and yet he's known as this guy that was endured incredible suffering. So this is it. So uh, we have to understand and say, well, just quickly go. We won't go through the whole story. But at the start, the reality is that we he probably hadn't had a lot of suffering in his life. When we first find Job in Job 1, it was probably quite a comfortable ride he had. In fact, that was Satan's word to God. He said, actually, no wonder he's doing so well and he's, he loves you. Everything's brilliant for him. And Satan was probably right. He was probably exactly right. Everything was great for him. 
But like we said, he hadn't been to any pain or suffering, maybe too much, that he, he, we, he could understand it. And so he's in this beautiful position to start with. But then he goes through this horrendous trial in just a matter of sort of hours or days. We don't really know the time scale exactly of it. And he's in this awful position, sat covered in boils, having lost everything. And not only is he in that point there, and I'm going to read one of my favorite verses that I've read about seven times already. I almost read it every time I come when we talk about Job. But what I want to encourage you is, is he wasn't surrounded by people that were encouraging him to get through. In Job 2, 8 to 10, this is his wife. Our wives are genuinely an encouragement, but his wasn't so good. This is what he said in Job 2, verse 8 to 10. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. She's not encouraging him right there. But Job replied, and, and I know I keep smiling every time I say this. You talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said, nothing wrong. So his wife comes around to him and said, just give up. What on earth are you doing? Why are you trying to just give up? It's time to go. Don't worry about it. Get over it. Just curse God and die. And so she's not encouraging. The word maintain, she says, will you maintain to your integrity? It means to hold fast. And Job is saying, now I am holding fast to the fact that who God is and what he's doing in my life and how true he is to everything. I'm not going to just throw it in because my circumstances have changed. So at the very start, Job is setting his goal saying, I'm going to get to the end. At the very start of his trial, even though his wife is encouraging him not to, he's making his mind up to get to the end. So that's the start. And then in the next chapter, in chapter three, he begins to look back begins to look back at sort of his life. And the encouragement that he didn't get would have been helpful now. But actually, he, he's on a pretty low. So the chap, whole of chapter three is almost him just saying, I wished I'd never been born. This is terrible. I wished I wasn't even here. What on earth is the point of my life? So looking back at his life, it wasn't helping him endure. And then he begins to look at where he is right now. What's his situation right now? What the mess is in right now? He begins to look at that a little bit and focus on that. And so let's look a few verses from Job chapter 6. And these are the things that he sees. First, uh, chapter 6 and verse 9, he says this. I wish he would crush me. I wish he would reach out his hand and kill me. Wow. It's not looking good for his journey of endurance because he's wanting God to just to squash him and wipe it out. It's not starting well. And then in verse 10, he says this, at least I can take comfort in this. Despite the pain, I have not denied the words of the Holy One. He says that in the middle of this, okay, so he feels as though it's all over, but he's, he knows that he's done the right thing. So he's looking at the now, where he is. He's saying, God, I, I don't get all of this. I wish I wasn't even here. But he's saying, well, actually, right now, I've still done the right thing. And then verse 11, he says this, but I don't have the strength to endure. I have nothing to live for. So this guy, Job, who's known for his endurance, is sat in this moment looking at his right now, and he's saying, I've got nothing left in me. It, it's all gone. I'm drained. I've got no strength. I've got nothing else. And I just know in this room and anyone else that might be watching, there'll be someone here right now that will be thinking, that's it. Everything I have has just gone out of me. I've got no energy left. I've got nothing in me. I just, I just can't keep on going. I can't do that endurance thing. I want to encourage you today. That's exactly where Job was, who was known at the end for his endurance. And he's in that position of saying, I wished it would all end. And then finally, just looking at where he's at now, in Job chapter 7, verse 16, in the next chapter, he says this. I hate my life. Are you still with me? It's not sounding good at the moment, is it? It's like when you get to that bit of the film that you think, flipping heck, it's got to get better than this. This is it. He says, I hate my life and don't want to go on living. Oh, leave me alone for my few remaining days. Job realizes that actually he can't go on living like this. He's in such pain. He's in such suffering. He's probably got days left, he's thinking. 
So he, he, he's thinking, I can't, I can't do this anymore. He's ready to give up. I just want to encourage you, if you're in one of those moments right now, just think of where Job is, and you think the thoughts might be quite similar to his, but just remember the end of Job. Just remember where he got to in the end. And I want to encourage you with that right now. Let that something be something that is so encouraged you that the guy that was known for endurance was at a point probably lower than you are right now. Yeah, he was known for getting to the end. You see, apart from the start, when he's decided to say, he doesn't look that great. He looks like the sort of opinion that I might have in that situation. So I'm encouraged by that, that he's willing to go. And and we can see that in the Bible. It's so great. So where does he carry on? What, What comes to him? What changes that actually means he gets through that point to the point of there is something. There is something in this that I can do. This is a real key verse, and I've not read it yet, and I keep holding it back, but I bought it in this week, um, and we'll look at it again in a few weeks as well. But Job chapter 19, right in the middle of the story, right in the middle of the arguments where everyone's on at him and they're saying you need to do this, 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 and this. Right in the middle of all of that, Job chapter 19 and verse 25. This is just one of the key verses in the whole of Job that we need to grasp hold. It says this in verse 25, but... That's most key, a lot of key verses start with a but, uh, it, and, it's, and it's a big but, but I won't go along that line any further. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body is decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself, yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. So right in the middle of this, there's something inside of Job that says, you can do this because there is something more than this. That word redeemer there, it comes from the word to redeem, which is the Hebrew gal. I think I wrote it down. Did I write it down? Is it on there? Is it there? G-A-A-L. Is that how you announce it? pronounce it, Paul? There we are. You didn't do Hebrew, so it's that definitely is pronounced gal. Okay, so and what that word means, it means to deliver, to avenge, and to act as a kinsman. Someone that redeems someone, this redeemer they're talking about, is someone that delivers, avenges, and acts as a kinsman. And the Old Testament theme is almost this exactly. God, all the way through it, what you do is it's his story of his, his redeeming his people. <laughs> He's delivering his people right through through the Exodus and right through the Old Testament. He's redeeming his people. He's avenging them. He's saying there's something else is coming. Eventually they mess up and then he comes back and he delivers them again. He sends someone to deliver them again. And it's the story right through the Old Testament that they avenged. And and that runs right through the whole thing. You see, Job's at this point and there's something in him. We looked at the sovereignty of God and he knows there's something of the sovereignty of God. He knows maybe from a bit of history, we're not quite sure when Job was written, but there's something of the history that says, do you know what I mean? I know God delivers his people and I'm one of his people and he will see me right in the end. The reality is he has a hope. He has a hope. And we're going to look specifically at hope, as I say, in a few weeks' time uh, and the key to what that all is all about. And maybe just as he's looking at what he knows of God, Maybe as he's looking at some of the past stories, but maybe he's beginning, maybe God prophetically is giving him something to look forward. He's looking forward to a redeemer that one day is going to stand on the earth. One day he's looking at the one that is going to come, that we know now did come, and his name is Jesus. He's the kinsman. Do you know what a kinsman is? A kinsman, as I looked up this, I got quite excited. It's one of a person's blood relations. A kinsman is one of a person's blood relations. That's what a redeemer is. Don't you get excited by the fact that I'm one of the kinsmen because of Jesus' incredible blood, because of his sacrifice that he laid down on the life on the cross for me. Suddenly, I'm becoming a part of his family. I have a hope that is beyond anything that anyone on this earth can ever take away because of the Redeemer that came and stood on this earth 2,000 years ago, laid his life down on a cross for me so that I could be, he could be my kinsman. He can be my father again. He can re- join that relationship that he had created from the very beginning and he's alive and he's living and he's your redeemer today if you will let him in 
I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand on the earth. He's our kinsman. He's our kinsman. That's our journey. That's his journey. That's Job's journey. It's just in the middle of this that he just had enough glimmer of hope of this Redeemer that is coming. Finally, and I've nearly done, I'm wrapping this up here. I just want to look at Hebrews and what it teaches us about uh, suffering and endurance and some real keys as to what that might mean for you and some practical stuff. I love the sort of the motivation parts that are exciting, but, but I need some practical stuff to take away. I don't know about you. Maybe the band could come up because I've literally nearly finished. I've got three points, but they're very short. And just as we read this, this is Hebrews 12 and verses 1 to 13. And I'm not going to read all the verses. I'm just going to read the first four, five, four verses and then verse 12 and 13. So I'll skip it over. So this is what it says in verse 1 of Hebrews 12. Therefore... This is following from Hebrews 11, funnily enough, 11 comes before 12. And in Hebrews 11, it's that incredible chapter of all the amazing people of faith that have done incredible stuff. And this is what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And let's skip right then through to verse 12. And it says this. So take a grip with your tired hands. Anyone got tired hands? I love it when the writer of Hebrews says, get a grip. With your tired hands, strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. What's the writer doing here? What does he tell us? Three real quick things that we can do that can help us. The first thing is this. Get rid of your rubbish. If you're running an endurance, you don't get many people running a marathon that win the London Marathon carrying 40 40 pounds of weight on their back. Why? Because they're carrying too much rubbish. And I'm not going to tell you what your rubbish is, but let me tell you, if you want to endure, you've got to get rid of the rubbish. Whether it's sin, whether it's stuff from the past that just keeps dragging you down, God would say to you today, get rid of the rubbish because I want you to get to the end. If it's the thing that keeps stripping you up, he's saying, get rid of it because I want you to get to the end. Don't just think, oh, I'll try and carry it a bit longer. Get rid of it today, right now in this place. So get rid of your rubbish. One, two, he says this, focus on Jesus. He endured the cross. He went through it all. Why? Because if you focus on him, someone that's already been there and gone through it, we've talked about what that means for someone that's gone through it. He's gone through it already. And as you focus on him, the Savior, the one that laid his life down for you, you'll be able to endure because your focus is focused ahead on all he's done, all he's going to do, and all he is to you. He's letting you go through this for a reason because there's a joy awaiting you. Just as there was a joy awaiting Jesus that helped him endure the cross, there's a joy awaiting you at the end of your trial, at the end of your suffering. And as you endure it, you'll see and experience the blessing of God like you've never seen before. And thirdly, finally, he wants you to help others endure. In verse 13, we read, Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. God's done it for a reason for other people around you too. He's let you go through whatever you've gone through. He's letting you go through right now whatever you go through because his body is an important part and he wants you to play a part by strengthening other parts of your body. So when he says strengthen your hands, so your hands are strong enough to go and strengthen someone else. He says when your knees are weak, he wants you to strengthen them so you can walk over to other people and you can help those people as well. Not just so that you can do it, but so you can help other people. It's how his body works. Let's just close our eyes right now and pray.